Hello, I'm Nancy Hay, another victim of CPS. On April 3rd, 2005, I gave birth to my daughter, Sabrina, at Fairfax Hospital. I was living with my soon-to-be husband, Kit Slater. He had low sperm count due to a medical condition, so we used an anonymous sperm donor from a sperm bank. Sabrina weighed 7 pounds 4 ounces at birth. At the first post-birth checkup I had with our pediatrician, she had dropped to 6 pounds 12 ounces. I was told that this was not unusual. The pediatrician recommended supplementing my breast milk with a half ounce of formula at each feeding, which I did. Sabrina's weight then plateaued, not gaining significantly. On my third visit, a senior physician in the practice said that this lack of weight gain was more serious than I had been led to believe. He told me to take Sabrina to Virginia Hospital Center, which I did on that day, April 16th. Sabrina was admitted with diagnosed failure to thrive. The hospital staff instructed me to double the amount of formula after each breastfeeding, which I did. Then Sabrina gained weight adequately. On April 19th, the social worker from the Arlington County Child Protective Services visited me. She compelled us under duress to sign a safety plan, saying that a refusal to sign would prevent Sabrina from being discharged. The following day, we were released from the hospital and Sabrina weighed 7 pounds, 5 ounces, an adequate weight for her age. For the next two days, the social worker came to our home to conduct an investigation. By the second day, we had been overwhelmed by the intrusiveness of her previous visits and we asked her not to enter. We stated that we wanted a time out while we retained legal counsel and handed her a letter to that effect. Over that weekend, we retained an attorney who immediately attempted to contact her and managed to speak to her sometime late Monday morning. However, she went forward with a request for an emergency removal order, which was granted by Judge Esther Wiggins Lyle and executed on that day, April 25th. Sabrina was placed in foster care. At the time of the removal, she weighed eight pounds, one ounce. In May, the JDR court made a finding of abuse and neglect and ordered psychological evaluations for both Kit and myself by county hired evaluators. The county developed a foster care plan that was accepted by the JDR court. The plan's stated goal was return home. It imposed several obligations on us, all of which we completed. I was diagnosed with a mild learning disability, pervasive developmental disorder which presents me with some challenges in reading nonverbal cues. Dr. Giselle Haas, the CPS appointed evaluator, alleged that this seriously impaired my ability to parent a child. We obtained a second opinion from Dr. Thomas Goldman, a professional of our own choosing, who stated that the disability was manageable and that I could successfully parent with proper support services. But Arlington County continued to cling to their position that my disability made me an unfit parent. They refused to offer any services tailored for parents with disabilities. For a while, we had visits with Sabrina in a baby unfriendly observation room at the DHS building. They were only an hour in duration and usually more, no more than twice a week. By early September, Sabrina showed increasing signs of distress during the visits, 
and so CPS then terminated all visitation in early September. In November, the JDR court ordered both CPS and ourselves to submit a plan for facilitating the goal of return home and to resolve Sabrina's distress. In December, the court accepted Kip's and my plan, which included regular, frequent visits with increasing duration and instruction from a qualified home-based service provider of our own choosing. The court also ordered that we pay for these services. In January, our visits were restored. Our service providers familiarized themselves with Sabrina and then carefully reintroduced her to us to restart the attachment process. We had visits three days a week in our home, and as time went on, the duration of these increased. We received helpful parenting advice, including a weekly parent-infant therapy session. The amount of instruction decreased over time, and the workers commended us on our rate of learning parenting skills. By mid-June, we had more than 20 hours a week with Sabrina, including two supervised overnight visits. We had quality time with her, and she no longer showed signs of distress. In June, the court accepted the county's proposal of change in goal put forth in March from return home to adoption. The judge acknowledged that we had made significant progress and had maintained consistent contact with Sabrina, but she alleged that we were too slow to learn adequate parenting skills. We appealed this to the circuit court. During that appeal, CPS controlled our visits with Sabrina and cut them back to only an hour a week. Sabrina's foster parents were allowed to move out of state with her. The appeal lasted from December 2006 through June of 2007. We had been simultaneously challenging the administrative finding of neglect issued by CPS at the time of the removal. This finding would have had our names appear on the Virginia Department of Social Services Child Abuse and Neglect Central Registry for 18 years. This appeal was heard on June 21st of 2006 by a hearings officer designated by the Virginia Department of Social Services. The officer found that the county had failed to pr prove that Sabrina met the criteria for physical neglect or failure to thrive, and he reversed the decision. Despite this ruling, CPS continued to argue vigorously for the termination of our parental rights with Judge James Almond of the Fourth Circuit Court. On June 1st, 2007, Judge Almond upheld that decision. He showed us prejudice against parents with disabilities, stating that my difficulty in reading nonverbal cues was a major reason why I was unfit to raise Sabrina. He alleged that this difficulty caused Sabrina to be hospitalized for failure to thrive by preventing me from instinctively knowing that I should feed her more formula than what her pediatrician recommended. He denied the petitions for custody filed by Kit and my mother, citing my mother's age and Kit's treatment for depression as factors that would make them unfit. Our case is now under appeal in the Virginia Court of Appeals in Richmond, but we have lost all visitation rights with our daughter.